On this episode, we stick to our principles. We're entering the owl zone. <laughs> we remain calm while working on the editors. Those little UI stuff, it just drives you crazy. And we drop some golden programming truths. UI is never not spaghetti code. <laughs> Mm. Hi everybody, this is Christian from Lazy Devs Academy. Welcome to the Advanced Schmap tutorial. We are at episode 76 and today we're entering the owl zone <laughs> a little bit. So at the beginning of the tutorial, and not just like this tutorial, like most of my tutorials are all about you experiencing me developing the stuff as I go. I won't copy over stuff that I prepared in the meantime, so you know exactly what goes into making all those things, especially the decision process, you know, all, and also all the mistakes and all that stuff. But this tutorial is getting pretty long and we have something on our plate that is a lot of working with the editors, like tuning the editors, making them a little bit nicer, fixing some small problems with the editors. And it's just like a lot of menial tasks where not a lot of like programming finesse is going into it. We're just gonna just do the grunt work on the UI stuff and your interaction and so forth. So instead of me doing like five more episodes of just doing editor work, I'm gonna condense everything down to just one episode, this one episode. I'm gonna fast forward my work and I, as always, I'm gonna do like a summary at the end of, you know, what happened and, and what the insights was and what difficulties were. It is late in the evening, let us get started. I'm just gonna cozy up and I'm just gonna get through all, the, all of the to-do lists. First of all, um, there's gonna be two big changes. I'm gonna maybe do those two things at the same time. Nah, I'm just gonna make them one after another and then I'm gonna copy off of the results because they're very similar additions. I wanna dig into N-Edit and then I also wanna dig into any edit And in both cases, I wanna see a preview. So in N-Edit, when I select an enemy, I wanna see that enemy. I wanna see the animation of the enemy and maybe some other stuff. Um, and with any edit the same thing. I wanna see the animation play out. All right, let us go. And we're done, I think, with this modification. So I create like a window and on top of the regular, uh, uh, how do I call it? The table, the table view, right? Uh, so I create like a little window. I did this um, using a clip, which if you forgot about this, is creates like a, it restricts all the drawing into like a smaller region of the screen. So everything that is drawn outside of the region just doesn't show up. So I'm restricting this. Uh, this is basically copied from the uh, file, uh, from the sprite did. And then I just do, do the drawing. I dr always have like this, um, the current sprite is supposed to be drawn to the screen. I save that into a variable uh, and I just draw that variable to the screen and that's it. And then, then I release the clipping region. I create a new clipping region for the lower half of the screen. Then I do the use the camera function to offset the entire the entire table further down, so I don't have to modify the, the table drawing code. And I just draw the table, and that's it. Um, the um, there is some cool functionality here that I kind of like. Uh, first of all, I can change the speed pressing um, W and S, so I can try different animation speeds. That's kind of like really nice. It's integer right now. I don't know, maybe I should do it non-integer somehow. I don't know how to do that. Uh, on the, you can always see also see the current frame that is being drawn to the screen. Um, and then there's a, a cool little detail. When I enter the edit mode, 
it stops the animation and that actually happened automatically because we just changed the update function and um, the animation is actually happening in the update function. So if we change update function, the animation actually stopped. Um, and in the typing in update function, I actually previewed the value that I'm typing in right now. So if I change the value to 18, I see there's different sprites. So I can try out the different sprites so I can easier find the sprite that I'm looking for. And go... <laughs> okay, <laughs> that didn't work. I need to fix this in a second. Uh, but yeah, if I'm in typing in stuff and pressing up and down, you can see that pressing up and down will increment and de decrement the value by one. So I can just quickly select you know, the value that I'm looking for, the, the sprite I'm looking for. Uh, the um, error that just happened right now, I think is like if I have nothing in the text and then I press up, um, yeah, I'm getting a nil value error. So let me fix that right in a second here. And then I'm gonna move over to, which one is the next one? The enemy editor. So it seems like uh, an edit is also finished. I basically copied most of the code that I just created in, in any edit. It's, it's basically was the same data structure was a bit dif difficult because we're not editing the animations here. We're editing enemies. So we have to take the enemy, get the animation and so forth. It's, it was a bit complicated. I was considering just creating like an enemy object using the enemy creation functions pre like previously. But it's not. I'm just grabbing an animation and drawing the animation like I did in any edit. So it's kind of a little bit fake. Um, but really, what the thing I care about the most in this preview is what does the enemy look like? Because like the number doesn't tell me anything. I just want to see the enemy. And when I'm picking the right animation, I just want to make sure that I, I pick the right animation, right? Uh, and I want to see maybe like a preview of the animation speed. Um, I, I probably like will rely more on any edit to kind of like figure out the correct animation to what looks good, uh, and uh, but it's just like to verify basically. I also made sure it's it's fairly robust so it doesn't crash if if the enemy is not like if it's not there the animation is not there or it's like some bogus value in here then it won't crash it it will just like doesn't draw anything right it actually waits for some kind of valid animation uh, value to appear. Uh, one major thing that I realized that I really need in this case is like when I scroll down the headers like the captions on each column uh, are remains that still like they're they, they're not scrolling with the, the rest of the table um, I'm basically drawing the tables again I'm just like the first row of the table is drawn again in its own little clipping region that is overlaid over on top of everything it's a little bit hacky uh, but I like when I scroll down, I want to be able to read like the, the little hints. Uh, it is it's very much possible that this gets a little bit expanded later on when I have like have to define like the position from where the bullets come out. And it might be nice and a good idea maybe to have like a little reminder of what how I'm encoding the ground and the collision stuff. But you know, that's kind of like little details. Uh, for now, I think we're done here and we can move on to the next one. The next one is going to be, uh, yeah, we're going to mess around with brain edit. Let's go.
All right, so we're done with a brain edit. I had a little to-do list here, but I've deleted it now. Um, right, so this was a bit of a UI challenge. I didn't know quite know where to put the new functions. I want to have a function to copy uh, brains and delete brains. Uh, there was already a setup button, so I thought maybe putting everything in one line, but then the line would get very long. It might cover space. I decided to go with um, like a drop-down menu, and I don't like this. This is not an ideal solution because you don't really know that there is a menu hidden in this button. But yeah, if you press the brain, the brain name button, it pops up this little menu where now the setup button is hidden in there. Um, so you can set up, you do the setup stuff, but you can also now copy a brain. Now it creates like a copy of this whole setup here. And you can also delete this. Uh, the bullets still remain, but you know, it doesn't matter. Um, and another thing that I also included is like I cover, carried over like the on staging from that we just developed, like to it, where you wait until an enemy appears on the screen and like the collision detection with the entire screen. I basically carried everything over from Kaushmap. So this behaves now exactly the way it behaves in Kaushmap. Happy with the way this works. Uh, no big surprises, just a little bit spaghetti code because this is a <laughs> UI. It's never UI is never not spaghetti code. <laughs> Uh, no, but yeah, no big surprises so far. All right, moving on to Skedit. I'm thinking of maybe cutting it a little bit short. There is a there is a simple problem and a big problem, and I think I, the simple problem will solve the big problem. Uh, but yeah, anyway, let's move on to Skedit. It seems like we've done with Skedit. This was, <laughs> this was, this was tricky, because um, okay. So let me see. Let me explain real quick what what's happening right now. So the problem was with this move function when I'm moving stuff around. Previously, when I clicked, it would move the spawning location, but it wouldn't move like like it would move the spawning location to where I clicked, but that's not necessarily where the enemy is, right? So now when I click, it actually moves the enemy to that location where I clicked, uh, which makes more sense to me. Um, another thing I also did, uh, I actually thought I wouldn't need it, but actually I decided to include it. So right now, when I mess something up and I move something to this like, oh no, where was it before, you know? I can still, at this in this move mode, I can still press um, uh, Y, so basically the O button, and it will undo the moving. So I actually have to, I have to confirm with X and then it will commit to the move. Uh, same thing when I right click, it will also cancel the moving. Uh, and there's even like a little blinking dot uh, uh, as a reminder where that enemy was before. So this is nice. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure where this enemy was before. <laughs> I, I, I screwed up some of the spawns here. Those spawns would have to be uh, redone a little bit. But yeah, uh, the problem there, there was actually a bit of a problem here and I did it in a most stupid way. <laughs> And that was insane way. Um, so the problem right now is the the update function doesn't actually know where the enemy is that we are moving. Uh, it's like we're drawing, like we're calculating positions of the enemies using like this kind of like very complicated function that we did here. That where, where is it? Yeah, this gen ends function here. With <laughs> it's like get is it a mirror enemy? Get the enemy. Get the brain. Get the trails of the brain. <laughs> Get calculate the age of the enemy, find out which trail we are on, get the position. You know, it's like this huge step process to 
encode like the, the get a schedule spawn and then actually create the object of the enemy that is actually visible on the screen. But the thing is like those objects that are visible on the screen, the update function doesn't know about these things. So <laughs> we cannot, like the information that is encoded in here, we cannot extract it. I mean, we could, but it would be, I, I don't like to do that. So instead, I, like, it's just like two two evils that I'm, I'm weighing against each other. So what I did is actually I recreated that entire function. Uh, so like all this code, I extracted it and, and repackaged it in a new function that is called calc offset, calculate offset. Uh, and that basically says like, okay, with this schedule or like with a spawn, calculate how, what the X and Y offset of the uh, uh, enemy would be at the current time. And um, yeah, I, I was considering maybe using then this function here, but there's like some other stuff happening here. I decided not to go for it. Um, yeah, so I'm using this then an update function and update uh, move. When I click, I take the mouse position, I calculate the offset of you know how far the enemy has moved from its uh, uh, origin. I take those values, subtract them from the mouse position, and that gives me the new updated spawning location, um, which is not where I clicked. It's somewhere else, right? Um, and yeah, and that's basically works. And then there's one more other thing where, it, where it's here. I have like three variables where I remember where an enemy was before I entered this move state. And then when I exit the move state, I just like re reconstruct it. That's it. I remember that mm, when we're copying stuff, uh, I want to make sure that when we're copying stuff, because when you're copying stuff, you also immediately jump into a move. Uh, I want to make sure that 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 this is taken care of as well. But otherwise, we're done here. We don't scan it, and that leaves us with just one last thing I need to add to the pattern editor, which is like copying a pattern, and then we're done. So let's go. Oh, uh, wait, actually there was a little bug. There was actually quite a few important things that I noticed. Um, one was that I didn't even realize that our timeline was not doing so well with the negative enemy types. And actually now I'm thinking it about this, we might have to encode, the, actually show the brain here, like display the brain here, not the enemy type, but the brain type here. That would maybe make more sense. Yeah, we maybe should, I probably should, should change it. So in the timeline, we don't see the enemy number, but the brain number. I think that makes more sense than showing the enemies. Right now, it doesn't really make a difference. But yeah, we had like this situation where when enemies are mirrored, their enemy number is negative. And again, the display didn't deal well with that. And when I was copying stuff, uh, when I entered the copy mode, it just basically completely broke. And the reason for that was that um, <laughs> the way I copy stuff was really <laughs> unhinged a little bit. Uh, so uh, I didn't use the copy list function, which I'm using in other editors. I just basically wrote four values down into an array, but now we have five values sometimes. So <laughs> I forgot about that. So now I'm using this copy list and that solved the problems with moving. And I'm also undoing the moving of, um, and properly saving the undo values for the move after a copy. Like those little UI stuff, it just drives you crazy. Anyway, uh, let me write the brains into the timeline of the schedule editor instead of the enemies. And then we can move on with, um, yeah, with the pattern editor. Let's go. And that was it. The last one was actually really easy. I expected that it would be easy, but yeah, still. So I added like this little uh, copy button already UI wise. This wasn't a very difficult decision. We already had a delete button there. So we just added a copy button now. 
So now when we have like this pattern and it's like, ooh, I really want to uh, mess around with this pattern. I can just like copy this. It gets added at the end of our pattern list. And now we have like a copy of this pattern and we can mess around with it. That's it. And we can, of course, still delete the, the new pattern and everything is cool and peachy. Good. This actually concludes all of the edits, all of the changes to our editors. Our editors are now a lot more capable. There's one little thing that I did not fix because it was a low priority thing. And that was that the schedule editor will break if there's no enemies. But I don't think I can, I can live with that. You know? <laughs> so yeah, that was the OWL episode where we made our editors a lot more capable. And so now let us move to the part at the end of each episode where I say a big thank you and a huge shout out to all the people. The beautiful people who are supporting this show on coffee.com who are making this show possible. Thank you so much for the continuous support. This time around, I have no big uh, comment or anything. I'm getting to the end of my list, but I have a shout out. Shout out to Dr. Bosky, who is actually working right now on an awesome shmup created in um, shmup creator. Wait, wait, what's the name of that? Yeah, yeah, I was right. Yeah, shmup creator. Shmup creator is like an engine, a bespoke engine to create shmups in. Like if you don't want to be like programming, you know, uh, uh, all purpose gaming engine, you want to really focus just on shmups. Uh, that's an engine that was created just like to make just shmups and it has like editor and all sorts of things that are very much designed to create shmups. So Dr. Bosky has been working on this beautiful shmup called Interstellar Sentinel. Dr. Bosky, supporter of the show and has sent me a review copy, kind of like an early uh, pre-alpha for me to check out. I did check it out. It was super fascinating. Uh, I did, uh, did give some input and Dr. Bosky immediately went ahead and implemented all of my corrections, all of my suggestions. This is shaping up really nicely. Check it out. It's a really outrageous shmup with some crazy ideas. Uh, a little little bit the style is a little bit um, like a death smiles which is a shmup by um, by cave but I personally I thought and that was my commentary I thought it was a little bit I don't know it has like this kind of like b-movie crazy b-movie vibe feeling that I got from something like you know a vampire survivors it's just like all over the place crazy stuff and <laughs> and just like insane things happening. And uh, after the corrections, even more insane stuff is happening. So uh, yeah, yeah, check it out. Interstellar Sentinel is the name of the game. Yes, yes, yes. So editor stuff is done. I think tomorrow morning, I will sit down in an early morning session and we will move on to new stuff, new things uh, like shadows maybe. Let's see. See you tomorrow, guys. Bye-bye.